Hello everyone, let's uh, talk about pendulums in lecture 27 and this is part 2 of the wave series. The first question to ask is, do pendulums exhibit simple harmonic motion? We know that if we ever met or if we ever have seen a pen grandfather pendulum clock, uh, then we know that pendulum exhibits some kind of repetitive motion, right? Some kind of period, it maintains some kind of period because it keeps time. And then it is only logical to ask, is this periodic motion uh, what we learned in SHM? Is it uh, actually an example of simple harmonic motion, this pendulum motion? Right? So let's look at a pendulum in detail. Let's say the pendulum is displaced uh, an angle of phi from a pivot or equilibrium position. And then when it's let go, it will travel in this red path as shown with a length of L, the length of the pendulum, all right? Now, uh, if we draw the free body diagram for this pendulum, we know that the tension acts along the length of uh, the rope connecting the rope to this bob. We call this a pendulum bob, okay? And the bob is basically just a point-like object. And the mass of the bob provides a weight, mg. Now only the only uh, the weight is responsible for creating any rotation or rotational motion that causes the pendulum to go back and forth. And I leave this as an open question. Why do you think that the tension doesn't contribute to torque? I hope you know the answer by now. All right. Okay. So we then use Newton's second law to determine. Uh, to determine what kind of angular acceleration this pendulum might have. So we just write down summation of torque equals I alpha. We know that the only component of weight that is responsible for any torque about this pivoting point X will be the horizontal component or the X component, mg sine phi. Okay? So torque, as we know, is defined as the force times the distance from the pivot times sine theta or F sine theta is basically just the perpendicular component of the force away from the pivot point. So we can just multiply the perpendicular component with the pivot point. The distance separ of separation from the pivot point to the bob is just the length of the pendulum, L. So what we do is we take this mg sine phi, multiply it with L to get the torque. And that is the only torque in the system. And it is in the clockwise direction. We chose counterclockwise to be positive, so we have a negative sign up here. And the moment of inertia for a point-like object is mr squared, r being the distance away from the pivot. This is ml squared times alpha. We want we solve for alpha to get alpha equal negative g over l sine phi. So the angular acceleration is proportional to some angle, uh, but uh, sine of some angle, right? If we compare to usual uh, simple harmonic motion, we know that the Newton's second law equation looks like this from where we see that acceleration is related to uh, displacement uh, directly, right? Because acceleration is directly proportional to the displacement. So if we have angular acceleration, this should be directly pro proportional to angular displacement. But here we see that this is not quite right. So this is actually not quite simple harmonic motion. So what? how do we get around the fact and approximate this motion as a simple harmonic motion? Well, we can say, and uh, we can say that, thank you, Euler, and uh, thank you, Taylor, actually, and go to some uh, formula or some uh, mathematical expression that is the most important mathematical formula that you can ever think of, called Taylor expansion, all right? Taylor expansion basically allows the uh, allows approximations of many kinds of uh, many kinds of mathematical uh, equations and mathematical expressions. Okay, and we use Taylor expansion to make what is called a small angle approximation in physics, where the functions of sine phi and cosine phi can be approximated, and sine phi approximated to phi and cosine phi is approximated to one. All that means is when the angle of displacement away from the pivot point, this phi, is very, very small, as if nearly close to zero, then we can approximate sine phi as just being that angle, phi, and cosine phi can be approximated as just being one. This 
stem comes out from this uh, magical thing called Taylor expansion. So thank you, Taylor, again. Then uh, we can look at this uh, expression for alpha, the angular acceleration again, and use our small angle approximation. In small angle approximation, when we consider phi to be very small, sine phi just becomes phi, and we end up with this expression of alpha, that is uh, minus g over l times phi. So we can see alpha, the angular acceleration, is indeed proportional to angular displacement for very small uh, angles. And so for very small angles, pendulums does exhibit or do exhibit simple harmonic motion. Okay. From here, because it is exhibiting simple harmonic motion, it is only logical to define uh, simple harmonic motion variables. So, in simple harmonic motion, we have already learned uh, we have only already learned about angular frequencies, or maximum angular frequencies, or something like that, frequency and period. So, all of these will be var uh, valid for pendulum motion when you have small angles. And if we look at one of these expressions, which changes slightly, a max from this Newton second law equation can be thought of as being negative. k over m, if you remember, omega was just equal to square root of k over m. So minus k over m is just minus omega squared times the amplitude a. Then a ma alpha max, if you compare to this, a, this uh, expression right here is just minus omega squared times a. Now alpha max has already an expression of negative g over l times phi. If phi is the maximum displacement, that is the maximum amplitude, then alpha max, actually the omega for a pendulum, the angular frequency for a pendulum, is just square root of negative g over l. If you just compare this expression right here with this expression and see that phi is the amplitude, there is the negative sign, there is the negative sign. So what is remaining? Omega squared is g over l. Omega squared is basically just g over l. So omega should be square root of g over l. So this is the angular uh, frequency for pendulums. Now let's dive into an example. So we have a grandfather clock pendulum which swings with a period of 2 seconds and we want to know what is the length of the pendulum. So we are only given period. So it's only logical to start with whatever we are given with. Given, right? T equals 1 over F. We know that the time period is related to the frequency. What is frequency? Well, for angular uh, or for any uh, simple harmonic motion, which pendulums is, we just established for very small angles, omega, the angular frequency, is related to the real cyc uh, cyclic frequency. Okay, This is 2 pi f, and f then is omega over 2 pi, the frequency, the cyclic frequency of completing one complete cycle in uh, completing cycles in period is omega over 2 pi related to angular frequency all right so in place of frequency if we write down this omega over 2 pi what is our goal here why are we writing this down well recognize that for pendulums we just calculated omega omega is nothing but square root of g over l and l is our target so we need this expression in our map Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. T is equal to 1 over F, which is 1 over omega by 2 pi, which is nothing but 2 pi over omega. And omega for a pendulum is square root of g over L. So 2 pi over omega is when you flip omega, right? So we have 2 pi square root of L over G. Our goal is to find L and we know everything else. Time period is 2. On this side you have 2 pi, you want to find L, and you know what G is. It is the acceleration due to gravity. Cancel to square root, or actually square both sides. This is 1, so just square 1. And on then you get 1 on this side, pi squared times 
L over 9.8. If you square a square root, then you just get this factor back. Then you cross multiply. 9.8 times 1 is 9.8, and 1 times pi squared over L is pi squared. Uh, 1 times pi squared times L is pi squared times L. If you divide both sides by pi squared, you get what L is, and L comes out to be uh, 0.99 meters, so very close to 1 meter. Okay, now let's look at a second part to the same problem. This part asks, how does period change, or if it does change, if uh, the amplitude A is increased? Well, what is period? We know that period from our previous work here, down here, is uh, related to omega, or angular frequency, as 2 pi over omega. And omega for uh, pendulum is given by square root of g over L. So we get a direct relation between time period and the length of the pendulum and the frequency, right? This is just 2 pi square root of L over G. This tells us that time period only depends on the length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity. So the time period would only change if you take it to another planet or the moon with a different value of G, or if you increase or shorten the length of the pendulum. Time period does not have any relation to amplitude. So therefore we say no change. Okay. Let's look at a third part to this problem. In the third part, we have a second pendulum, which has half the length of the first pendulum. Okay, so let's just write that down first. The second pendulum, let's say L2, is one half the old pendulum, L1. Okay, one half the length of the old pendulum. Meaning, we know the length of the old pendulum to be around one. So this is one half times 0.99 meters, and L2 therefore is uh, 0.5 meters. Okay, as simple as that. Now, what do we want from here? We want to know how many oscillations will this second pendulum complete in one second. This is just a worded version of saying what is the frequency, because frequency is the number of oscillations you complete in one second number of cycles completed in one second, right? It all makes sense, hopefully. And then we know that from the previous part, we established that time period is related to the length of the pendulum. So if you are changing the length of the pendulum, you are changing the time period. And also time period, as we know, is related to the frequency, one over f. So if you're changing the free time period, you're also changing frequency. So our starting point in this problem should be by investigating that. How does the time period change? Let's call the new time period T2. And we know that the time period is equal to 2 pi times square root of L over G. L is L2 and G is just 9.8 still. And if we do that calculation, 2 pi square root of 0.5 over 9.8, the time period T2 just becomes uh, 1.42 seconds so if you have the length of the original pendulum the time period will be uh, this 1.42 seconds okay so how is it related to the old time period the old time period was two seconds for a length of around one meter and for a length of around half meter your time period is 1.42 seconds so what does this tell us this is just that to start repeating your oscillation again you would need 1.42 seconds. So the oscillations or the wave or this uh, whole pendulum is uh, repeating its motion every 1.42 seconds. So what is the frequency? How many oscillations are actually completed before this time period or by this time period? 1 over T2. So the F2 is 1 over T2 and 1 over 1.42 seconds just gives me a frequency of 0.7 hertz meaning you have you complete 0.7 hertz every one second all right so you complete one full oscillation in 1.42 seconds one full oscillation takes 1.42 seconds and then in uh, every second for every second you complete 0.7 full oscillations all right
I hope this pendulum problem and this whole lecture makes some sense. Thank you very much.